So net energy analysis is what I study. I don't like how my camera's cutting off the top of my head. Okay. Net energy analysis. Okay, so we use energy for goods and services. We learned that in the first four lectures. Uh, we've been continuing to learn that over the course of the quarter. We're learning now where this energy comes from and what sort of uh, um, social and environmental harm it can cause, namely climate change, which is both a social and environmental harm. But we use energy for all these different things. We learned about our personal energy use, but there's something else that we use energy for. Um, so what's on here that we use energy for that's not listed? And the name of the lecture is net energy analysis. Any ideas? Partying? Yes, we definitely use energy to party. We need to get that energy to party from somewhere. It's kind of like learning circular living yes eating yes so all these things take energy drinking yeah producing goods i'm just gonna hang out here creating more energy there you go so all these things that take energy, take energy. And so we need energy to make energy, right? We need, to, we need to burn energy to drill for oil. We need to burn energy to build solar panels. Um, so the, the second thing, it's mixing, mixing, sorry, I'm in difficulty speaking, is energy for energy. Um, so here are several different examples at very different scales of energy collection. So here's firewood in South Africa. Uh, these people are spending energy, harvesting energy. Um, here's coal mining in the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. Um, vast quantities of energy are being used to exhume this coal and deliver it to uh, via Bellingham to Vancouver and then across the Pacific Ocean. Um, here's the Thunder Horse oil platform, the largest uh, man-made structure ever created. And uh, this took a tremendous amount of energy. You can see that it has one, two, three, four, five natural gas turbines powering it right there. And this is for acquiring energy. It's a massive structure that took energy to acquire energy. Here's a wind turbine blade. And here is a silicon ingot used to make solar panels. They have to be heated to over a thousand degrees Celsius to create a pure, a relatively pure um, crystalline form of the, of the silicon. So getting energy takes energy. What's the function of an energy industry? What makes an energy industry good? I have a picture of Aristotle to kind of give you a hint. Produce more than it consumes, absolutely right. Yeah, making money, which is a marker of energy, or it's a marker of being able to change things. It's a marker of power, and that's what, that's what energy is too. The more money you have, the more choices you have. The more energy you have, the more choices you have. Um, so the functioning of a good energy industry is fundamentally the energy industry takes labor, capital, and energy inputs and consumes them in an effort to deliver usable energy to society. A functioning energy industry delivers more energy to society than it consumes. Um, and Aristotle said something like, a good hammer is a hammer that nails. Hammer is a nail, good and true. A good thing is a good thing. A good human being is a good one. It's kind of circular, I guess. But um, in the case of an energy industry, obviously one that delivers more energy than it consumes is what makes it good. Uh, so this is the operating definition that um, a group of us that convened, I think in 2014, down at Stanford, trying to develop this field of net energy analysis or macro energetic genetics, macro energetics. Um, it's been around since the very late 70s and the, for the first oil embargoes, but then it, it fell asleep for, I don't know what reason, for about 20, 30 years. And then 
we're trying to revive it as we help uh, um, analyze and spur this transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And so when we switch to renewables, we damn well better know how much energy it takes to deliver energy from these renewables. In fact, a lot of uh, opponents to renewable energy over the last decade, 2010 to 2020, um, were saying spurious things like it takes more energy to build solar panels than, uh, than they create. Um, I saw an unfortunate um, line from a recent Joe Rogan podcast I'm not a fan, but I still read different things that get produced by, by his work. And some of his guests are good. But anyways, uh, I forget which guest said that um, electric cars they produce more carbon than uh, gasoline-powered cars because they're powered by coal. That is only the case in two counties in the entire United States. I worked on a white paper in Tesla that I'm not supposed to be talking about with Tesla, I'm not supposed to talk about it in this record and put on YouTube. So I don't know what's gonna happen after that. But we analyzed every single county and there's only two counties where a, tes a Tesla did worse than a gasoline powered vehicle. And that was because it was powered by coal. But across all the other counties, a Tesla's gonna do better um, than a uh, gasoline powered better vehicle in terms of carbon. And along that tangent, solar panels produce more energy than it takes to build over time. We're not going into some energy debt by making solar panels. All right, so these, this idea isn't new. Um, you know, the first ideas for net energy analysis were developed by Charlie Hall back in 1972. He was an ecologist. He is an ecologist. Uh, he's still at um, um, University of New York, Sunnybrook. And he was studying fish and he was looking at the small the baby fish, I'm not a fish person, fry, I don't know what they're called. They were going up a stream, spending a lot of energy going way upstream. And then um, he wondered why there was burning so many calories to go upstream. Well, it turns out that they, uh, they were able to get more food in these upstream re reaches, reaches. And they were able to um, get, acquire 25 times more calories by swimming upstream than they spent in terms of uh, going upstream. And so Charlie Hall's insight was, well, do humans do that? What do, how much energy do we spend getting energy? And what do we do that makes it worth it? So this early work in system scale energy efficiencies was inspired by biologists and ecologists, but then it was adopted by economists and physical scientists. Um, this is one of those kind of intuitive things that once you hear it, you're like, well, duh. I've, I experience that all the time, and it seems like life does that too. So here is an Arctic fox. She is spending energy running around trying to get a mouse, and she better get more energy from that mouse than she spent chasing it around. And if she gets more energy from the mouse, then good things happen for fox society, puppies. And if she doesn't get more energy from that mouse than she spent chasing it, then bad things happen for fox society, and you get a sad picture. Um, and so we can see this in early humans as well, as, as, is, as, as well as present day humans. So in early human societies, uh, we've been historically subjected to energy return limitations. So hunters and gatherers on average must capture and gather more calories than they expend on hunting and gathering. If they don't, those, those societies fall apart. They start, they disappear. Um, and then with the advent of uh, farming about 10,000 years ago, uh, hunters and gatherers in different groups settle down and begin farming practices, but they must grow more calories than the, than the effort expended in growing their food. If they don't, then again, they starve and those societies collapse. Um, and you can see this in present day, right? We're not hunting and gathering or agrarian farming based communities anymore, but we certainly harvest a tremendous amount of energy to run our societies and societies that have an excess amount of energy grow rapidly. Um, that's the case in particular in America post-World War II and uh, societies that are running out of energy uh, disappear. So you can look at that in the, you know, Cyprus and the Mediterranean in 400 BC. You can look at that um, collapse of Roman Empire, uh, the diminishment of the United Kingdom or the British Empire following uh, the transition from coal to oil. Um, you can look at places like Easter Island or Iceland that have no 
trees left at all. What happened to those trees was the primary source of energy and they all got cut down. Uh, what was that person thinking when they cut down the last tree? Not a whole lot, probably I'm cold and I got mine and I'm gonna light a fire with this son of a gun. Um, and so that's, you can track these rises and falls of civilizations to their net energy availability. How much ener excess energy do they have available? Um, sometimes I give this to uh, financially minded people, this talk. Uh, so I have a financial analysis that makes sense to them. You have to invest money to make money. To be profitable, you need to make more money than you invest. That's pretty obvious. Uh, investments with higher rates of return are better than investments with lower rates of return. They're more desirable. Investments that are more profitable have shorter break-even times and they're easier to grow quickly. And so we can apply some of these financial ideas to, um, to energy systems. And that's what, what the group that I work with does. And so we've titled it Net Energy Analysis or Macro Energetics. Um, and we find out that it takes energy to make, operate, and decommission devices and systems needed to produce energy. For a device or system to be useful to the global energy system, the energy outputs must be greater than the total energy inputs. And if this happens, then it can bootstrap, it can build itself up. You build a wind turbine with some energy and it generates a bunch of energy, enough to pay for itself energetically, and there's more enough energy left over, you can build another wind turbine. Then you have even more energy left over and you can build more and more in wind turbines. Um, solar panels aren't so expensive anymore. I'm seeing a comment in the chat that uh, production of electricity from solar uh, and wind is now cheaper than natural gas. It's the cheapest form of electricity to generate. It's just variable and intermittent dependent upon the weather. And that's, that's the catch with it. Uh, we'll discuss that um, in the weeks to come. So general insights from net energy analysis is a primary energy resource must provide more energy to society than it's consumed in extracting, processing, and distributing the energy. So you have to, you have to build that energy infrastructure and you have to distribute it. So maybe that's one of the problems with, with wind and solar is not only do you have to build a solar panel and wind turbine, you also have to build a battery that takes more energy. So I wrote a paper uh, back in 2013 that looks at how many batteries you would build before you no longer produce a net amount of excess energy from, from wind and solar. Turns out quite a bit. It turns out you can build, uh, you can store up to like 30 to 40% of the energy from wind and solar before you start uh, running into energy debt. Um, net energy returns will decrease as the quality of the resource declines. We're seeing that with oil um, as we've gone from light, sweet, uh, oil in East Texas or West Texas and Saudi Arabia and Brunei, for example, to lower quality oil, um, tar sands, tight oil, shale oil, offshore oil. It's taking more and more energy to produce that barrel of oil. Um, and so the net energy returns from oil production is going down. I don't know what's going on. My dog has fleas or something. Granny, calm down. Um, Net energy returns will increase as technology is improved. We've also seen that with oil, right? We, when we um, discovered horizontal drilling and fracking, fracking, all of a sudden the energy returns from oil went up because we had access to more and more oil. Um, and then certainly with, with renewables, this is the case. As we build more and more renewable resources, wind turbines, solar panels, we get better at doing it. It's an economic phenomenon called learning by doing. You build a picnic table, it's going to take you all weekend long. That second picnic table is only going to take you a day. That third picnic table you build might take you four hours because you get better at it, right? It takes less and less effort. And we're seeing this, this net energy growth uh, with renewables right now because these technologies are pretty early in their learning cur curve. Um, oh, yeah, I missed point two. Somebody pointed that out. Energy resources that do not meet this criteria are either subsidized by other energy resources or uneconomic. So, um, so resources that don't provide more energy than it takes to build them, uh, you need to subsidize it. So that was the case with solar panels in the aughts and before then, um, a, the solar panels were being built, and they still are to a certain extent today, with electricity derived from fossil fuels, right? You, or or um, even direct heat. So you, you heat up a furnace with natural gas to melt the silicon, so the, all that energy input that's going into a solar panel is being subsidized by, by natural gas. Uh, but now solar panels make plenty of excess energy that they're able to take care of themselves. 
Um, there are different fossil fuels that are subsidized in the sense, uh, um, I guess it's not fossil fuel, but corn ethanol is a, is a hydrocarbon fuel that replaces gasoline, replaces octane. And it is certainly subsidized by natural gas. We take natural gas, um, make ammonia nitrate fertilizer with it, put it all over the fields of Iowa, grow corn, and then use natural gas again to um, distill that corn and make ethanol. And by the time it's all said and done, you've actually spent more energy making the corn ethanol than you get from the corn ethanol. And so it's subsidized. It's a big energy laundering scheme. Um, not all uh, ethanols uh, negative or below one to one in terms of the energy. Places like Brazil that grow cane sugar to make ethanol have have higher returns. All right. So the industrial revolution was fueled by lots of things. It changes to ideological constructs, possibly caffeine, the movement of caffeine from India to England, but is certainly fueled by easily accessible, cheap, abundant fossil fuels, town gas and coal, mainly coal. And so this led to this very rapid, large payback and it led to this upward growth spiral of increasing energy supply. Now all of a sudden for the first time, societies had a tremendous amount of excess energy. Before then, most of the energy um, went into energy. So about 90% or more of all energy went into energy. So Picture um, uh, peasantry with farm fields, sheep fields, herding fields, they would grow crops to feed their animals that then they would use to till to grow crops to feed themselves. And so all this energy, all this bioenergy went into providing bioenergy to grow a little bit of food. Um, and whatever excess energy was available went to a few feudal lords. Yes, I'm being very Western centric right now, but it was, it was basically that way um, in, in uh, East Asia as well. So there's not a lot of extra energy available. The energy that is available goes into producing more energy to make food. Um, now, post-industrial revolution, that's completely flipped. Now only about 10% of our energy goes into food. And now we have 90% extra energy to do all sorts of things we like, like hot shower, Cold beer, fast cars, massive concerts, traveling the world, uh, video games, whatever. Um, and so now the picture looks like this. We have this energy sector that produces energy that goes to society. And a little bit of it, about 10%, loops back to feed the energy sector so that it can actually produce energy. Historically, this was flipped. Most all the energy from the energy sector went back into the energy sector and there's only a little bit left over. All right, this is boring, but I'll read it. Uh, again, we're trying to build this field up so we need a few maxims. Um, a few of them are, by definition, net energy analysis is the determination of the amount of primary energy direct and indirect that is dissipated in producing a good or service and delivering it to the market. And so it's a form of life cycle assessment. We try to count how much energy it took to build a solar panel or a gas turbine and how much energy it took to harvest the natural gas or the coal and deliver it to that power plant, that sort of, sort of thing. If you're really interested in this, I do teach a class. Um, it's 400 level class, I'm blanking on the, it's 466, energy 466. It's net energy analysis and life cycle assessment. Let me go into this into great detail. Um, there are many different metrics that have been developed over the years. Um, two of them that are the most common one are energy return ratios, and that's the energy return on investment. It tells us how many times a given investment of energy will pay back. So if you, you burn a barrel of oil to, to um, pump oil up from, from the ground, how many barrels of oil do you get out of the ground? And that would be some energy return ratio. I'll go through examples in a second, so this hopefully will start to make sense. And then the other thing that matters is energy payback time. So if you burn some energy to harvest energy, how long does it take before you break even? Uh, so you, you build a solar panel with, I don't know, a gigajoule of energy. How long does that solar panel have to sit in the sun before you get that gigajoule of energy back? 
and then after which you it's, it's all profit but before then you're in energy bed so the concept of energy return ratios compare the amount of energy produced by an energy system to that which it consumes so here's one the most basic one is energy outputs divided by energy inputs and a few caveats on the inputs though. We're only counting about energy that society in a sense pays, right? So you wouldn't count the sun as an energy input for a solar panel. You'd only count the electricity and heat required to build the solar panel. Just as you don't count the coal or the natural gas that feeds an, a power plant, you'd only count the amount of energy it took to harvest the coal and deliver it to the power plant. Um, and in this way, the energy return ratios are always greater than one for successful extractive industries. That means you're getting more energy than you, than you get back. Um, but energy return ratio less than one means that you're subsidizing it with other energy. You're, you're getting less energy than, than you paid for it. It can never be negative. That would violate the uh, first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so energy flow for a single plant. This is an example. Um, the y-axis is joules per year, um, and then it's divided at the, um, by the x-axis, which is time, and anything greater than one means an energy output. Anything less than one would be an energy input, again, in terms of joules per year. And so from time zero to time one, is the energy required to build some power plant. I'm not saying what it is, it's just power plant, you have to build it. And so those are all energy inputs required to build it. And then it operates for a long span of time and it generates energy that entire time. So this is EG, energy generated or energy production in a certain amount of joules per year is for an X, X number of years. Um, but during that time, it also takes energy to operate it, right? So this might be energy required to deliver coal or energy required to clean a solar panel. Um, this, this operation and maintenance phase, or maybe to run a battery to, to supplement your solar farm so that you have continuous energy. And then finally, at the end of life, it takes some energy to de decommission it, to tear it down, recycle it, whatever. And so this, the bottom here is all energy inputs. The top is all energy returns. Um, my friend Mick made this, he's at Clemson University. He likes PowerPoint animations, but it's pretty clever. And so you get this energy generated divided by the energy required to construct, operate, and decommission it. So in other words, it's all the energy outputs over the energy inputs, the energy return on energy invested. That's what that EROI stands for. So <clears throat> that's one equation uh, that you'll use for the homework that I'll, I'll send out next week. The other equation that you'll use is the energy payback time. And so this is the energy in divided by annual energy out. So this is energy over energy over time. So you have energy over energy over time, it equals time in the numerator. So it tells you how long it takes for something to pay for itself, to pay back. So in terms of that diagram, it'd be all the energy inputs construction, operation, and decommissioning divided by the energy generated in each year. And so each year you generate a certain amount of energy. As soon as that equals this sum on the top, then you have paid back the amount of energy and it'll tell you how, how, how much time it takes to pay, pay it back. So here's an example from White and Kolsinski there at, uh, um, UW-Madison over in uh, Wisconsin. And so they were looking at a coal power plant and they determined that it took four years to build it and 147 terajoules to build it. And then it operated for 40 years. Over those 40 years, it generated 946 petajoules or 24 petajoules per year. 24 times 40 is 946. But it also required 83 petajoules over the 40 years to, to operate it. And then a uh, little bit of energy to, I guess, walk away from it. That's usually what coal plant owners do. 
And so the EROI is the energy generated divided by energy for construction, operation, and decommissioning. Um, uh, this is wrong. I did this to illustrate. You got to be careful with the units. So petajoules are not equal to terajoules. And so a petajoule is 1,000 terajoules. So adjusting for that, we have 946 petajoules divided by this sum here. What's EROI? It is the energy returned on energy invested. So it's all the energy returned from a power plant or an entire energy sector um, divided by all the energy inputs to that power plant or sector. So this is a coal power plant. Its energy return is 946 petajoules. Its energy invested to build and operate that power plant is this sum down here. And its total EROI, how many times it pays for itself, is 11 times over. So that's pretty good. Society invested a certain amount of energy into this coal power plant and it got 11 times back. That's great, right? If your bank gave you a return of 11, you'd be pretty stoked on that. Right now your bank return is like 0.1 or some, something miserable. In terms of energy payback time, how quickly it pays for itself, well, that's all the energy costs divided by how much energy it generates per year. So that's either 24 petajoules, or you can do the math and say 946 petajoules here divided by the time of generation, which is 40 years. So if we do that math, we see that the power plant pays for itself in three and a half years. So typically a coal power plant might operate for about 30, 40 years. So after a year, three and a half, everything after that is net energy available to society. Society's paid for it, and now it just gets energy to do all the wonderful things that society wants to do. So this example, coal power plant had an energy return on energy invested of 11 and an energy payback time of three and a half years. <clears throat> Couple general insights, and general, they don't apply to everything. Um, this is definitely not a well-defined science yet. It's not physics, it's probably closer to something like evolutionary biology where everything feels right and we're trying to map it out, but there's no like theory of general relativity. But some general insights are non-renewable technologies have large operating and maintenance costs, things like power plants, and they're usually associated with the fuel cycle, right? So we have to continue to deliver coal or gas to a power plant that takes energy. Redu renewable technologies usually have large upfront costs, and I'm talking about energetic costs, but they can be pretty well mapped to financial costs as well. You have to invest a lot of energy to build a carbon fiber wind blade, or you have to invest a lot of energy to melt silicon to make silicon crystals. But then once it's there, it just harvests energy, not much happening afterwards. This is certainly the case with hydropower, right? Tremendous amount of energy to terraform a canyon and build a massive concrete dam. But then once it's there, it just sits there for 100 years and makes energy, converts energy, let's be accurate. So what do you think, which resource on average today has the highest EROI? Or let's flip it, which one has the lowest EROI? Let's see if you've been paying attention to what something I said 10 minutes ago. Corn ethanol, yeah. So corn is really just a big, energy laundering scene where we're turning natural gas into ethanol via fields and the sun and all sorts of other things. So which one might have the highest EROI do you think? Oil, wind, and solar, we're seeing all of them. Um, oil depends, it depends on where it's at. In general though, it's actually wind. Um, wind has the highest EROI. And that's because wind turbines um, don't take as much materials as solar panels. It's just the, the blades, it goes as, um, it goes as one dimension, right? The radius of the wind blade, whereas solar panels, the amount of material requires goes as radius squared. It takes a square of a solar panel, not just a line, maybe I'm being too obtuse. Um, is it corn ethanol advertises super clean? Yeah, because they're only looking at the, um, the, the part of the life cycle from growing the corn to the tailpipe. And so they say, well, it, um, it pulls in energy from the sun, grows this corn, 
and then draws carbon from the atmosphere, makes um, the plant and the sugars that are then converted to corn ethanol, and then that carbon goes back into the atmosphere when you burn it. So in that sense, it's kind of carbon neutral. The amount of carbon it produces is about the same as it took in. But it's failing to understand that those fields in Iowa and the other, other places in the Midwest are all heavily fertilized with ammonia nitrate, which is derived from natural gas. So if you look at the whole life cycle back to where the fertilizer comes from, then it's not clean. Um, yeah, so wind has the highest, then probably oil-ish, maybe solar, then corn ethanol. So this is dated 1986, but a lot of this stuff is more or less the same. Hydro is thought to have an EROI greater than 100 now, just the dams continue to chug along. Um, wind has an EROI between about 30 and 86 today. Uh, coal has an EROI of about 10 to 18. Oil on average still about 15. It was going down, but then with horizontal drilling, it started bumping up a little bit. But if you go to a place like Saudi Arabia, where you have light, sweet, crude, meaning you don't have to spend energy removing the sulfur, sulfur, that's what the sweet part means. And you don't have to spend a lot of energy pumping. That means that's what the light means. It means it's running, it has a, has a, a low viscosity. It has an energy return of about 100 to 1. Um, something like Canadian tar sands, they only have an energy return of 5 to 1. And that's because it takes so much energy to process the tar. It's often uh, cannibalistic. You're burning oil. You're burning the tar to, to uh, process the tar. Um, cane ethanol down in Brazil and other tropical regions, 10 to 1. But then corn ethanol, 1 to 1. Uh, you get just as much energy back as you put in. And here's a few other ones. Okay, yeah, here's tar sands. Nuclear can get as high as 10, um, depending on what method is used to uh, enrich the uranium. Um, yeah, so yeah, nuclear takes a lot of energy to separate the U235 from U237. It only has less than a percentage difference in mass. And so that's why you need these big centrifuges to, to spin them. But newer techniques like using um, uh, fluoridized uranium and laser trapping may produce much better returns. Point is, um, economics though dictate that wind and solar are gonna be much cheaper than nuclear at this point. Nuclear was a good idea, but it kind of missed its opportunity. It, was, it could have taken off in the 70s as it did in France, for example. That's why they have uh, the lowest um, carbon dioxide emissions as a function of GDP. Uh, it's because they're they're run on nukes, but now uh, there are much cheaper, much safer options than the nuclear power. All right, so that was a brief introduction to net energy analysis. Again, it's a young science. Um, what do you all think might be some issues or problems or caveats associated with net energy analysis? Try to break it. Right? Why is why is this just a pseudoscience at this point? Absolutely. So, um, sorry, I lost the chat. Yeah, Rosie said something like disagreeing on what counts as inputs. Yeah, so what where, where do you count? Um, this is a problem broadly in life cycle assessment, uh, the, the field of uh, looking at how much materials, energy, carbon, whatever goes into building things. And um, where, do you, where do you stop counting the inputs? Uh, in general, we try to focus primarily just because on that energy analysis, just the energy supply chain. So one of the more famous uh, products from that energy analysis is so-called well-to-wheel analysis for gasoline-powered cars. So how much energy does it take to build the oil well, produce the oil well, ship the oil, refine the oil, put it in a car to finally move the car forward? Um, but there may be other things that are forgotten along the way. Uh, externalities, yeah. Absolutely, there could be all sorts of things that, that does not get counted or it does get counted, but doesn't get included into the, the, the analysis. Um, doesn't factor into environmental long-term costs. Yep, that's another one, uh, particularly in the decommission phase, the end of use stage of these things. Um, a lot of power plants just get abandoned. Um, 
to become something like a super fun site. And so they don't, there is actual no real energy input that's counted into, into decommissioning these things. Um, yeah, precise measurements for inputs and outputs. It's a big problem. One of the reasons, one of the hardest things about this is that a lot of books are kept by oil companies, coal companies, solar panel manufacturers, all these things, but it's all in terms of money, right? So I had a student try to um, conduct a net energy analysis of iTech Solar. It's now um, Solfab downtown in Bellingham. We're trying to figure out the energy inputs, but all we had was their power bill. And so we we take the power bill and try to translate money into uh, energy consumption. Um, and that happens across the board. You, you won't know how much diesel went into uh, powering the massive machines that, that uh, produce Powder River Basin coal, for example, in, in Wyoming. But you do know how much the company paid for the diesel. And so then you have to backcast the price of diesel divide that and then try to figure out how much diesel is actually used. And so yeah, precise measurements are a huge problem. And so it's still in the early phases, we're just trying to collect as much data as possible and try to ascertain some general trends. And we're also doing things like writing manifestos for why it matters. And that's what we did back in 2014, we wrote a paper called uh, a better currency for investing in a sustainable future. Um, and so we're trying to make the case for why net energy analysis matters. And one of the analogies we used is that um, when you're steering something that's really complex, it's best to have as much information as possible, as many indicators as you can. And so this is a seven triple seven flying out of Dubai, and you know there's all sorts of gauges for wind speed, altitude, pitch, whatever. I'm not a pilot, but this looks complicated to me. Um, as things get more sophisticated, you should have more information on how to operate it. If you're driving something like a go-kart, you only a bumper car, you only have one, one indicator. That's a gas pedal. You don't even have a brake pedal. And as soon as you have a go-kart, you have like gas and brake, nothing else. As soon as you have like a normal vehicle, like a Honda Civic, you'll have tachometer, odometer, um, speedometer, gas gauge, those sorts of things. Maybe if you have something more sophisticated like uh, um, Tesla or uh, Ferrari or something, you'll have more things like tire pressures, things like that to make sure that your, your vehicle is running in peak efficiency or performance. Um, as soon as you're up to a 777, again, you have this wide array of gauges. Right now, we run all of society basically on one metric. What, what metric do we use to to understand how society's flying. Any ideas? Money, yeah, GDP. That's the only thing that we really count. Um, so it's crazy to us that, that we're running this, you know, massive society of 7.8 billion people um, and clearly not in a sustainable fashion. And we're only concerned with one metric. And so we argue that uh, several other metrics are very valuable and other people agree with us too. So things like happiness index, human health index, education index, um, uh, women equity indexes. Uh, and this is another one that we argue should be uh, considered and that's uh, the net energy um, analysis or the energy return on invested for the energy um, sectors of the economy. And so we say it will do couple of good things. Um, one, it'll value energy resources. We can compare different energy resources to each other. So back to the function of an energy industry, it should deliver more energy than it requires. And so let's, let's see which one's the best, which one's the best in actually providing energy for society in terms of a purely energetic basis. And then beyond that, we should think about the environmental impacts from those different energy sectors. So among a, a similar energy um, sector, oil, for example, ones that have a higher energy return on energy invested will be less damaging to the environment because what is wasted energy? It's environmental change. And so if there's less wasted energy, there's less invested energy per energy out, then there'll be less environmental damage. Uh, same thing could be said for wind turbines, solar panels, whatever. Um, let's get what we want, which is the energy and minimize the things we don't want, like wasted energy, environmental change, environmental harm. Um, 
we're creating all these other metrics that are complementary to that energy analysis, like amount of energy produced versus amount of carbon produced or amount of energy produced versus land use change, these sorts of things. Uh, I've been focusing a lot on energy storage lately. So I'm coming up with my own metrics, like how much energy do you store in a battery versus how much energy it took to build a battery. Uh, batteries that last longer have higher round trip efficiencies are better batteries because they waste less energy compared to how much energy it took to build them. Um, something like a lead acid battery only has an energy stored on energy invested of about 500. You only get to store about 500 times the amount of energy in that battery as it took to build it. Whereas something like a lithium ion battery, you get about you get about uh, 3,000 3, to one. Something like a stupid PVC gas tank in a Honda Civic gets like 30,000 to one because it's just a piece of plastic that stores 10 gallons of gas 30,000 times or 3,000 times. Um, so thinking about these things uh, can be really important. Uh, I've already made the case that net energy fuels the economy. And so we should be paying attention to this. We should see how things are, are floating. How much extra net energy do we have available to, um, to do all the better things in life, um, like uh, education or, uh, or recreation or um, you know, people fulfilling their interests and passions, that sort of thing. If you're spending all day just getting energy, you're not able to do these other other things. Um, early technology appraisal again. So this is what I do. Some of the battery stuff. I already talked about that. And finally, managing the energy transition. So, um, wow, what did I just plot here? Oh, this is a paper I I failed to submit. I need to submit this thing. Um, so this I'm looking at the. Um, kilowatt hours per kilogram of CO2 equivalent for different energy resources going through different energy storage systems. So if we're going to power the society with, you know, renewable resources, they may need storage because of their intermittent and variable nature. What is the true carbon cost? What is the true energy cost of doing these things? And first I analyze what our what we're doing today. So if we look at today's US average power grid as an EROI of about 18, which what natural gas is, and it has a um, carbon emission of about 500 grams per kilowatt hour, or what, uh, two, kilogram, two kilowatt hours per kilogram. So anything up here is gonna be better than our current status. So basically pairing wind with any kind of storage is a great idea. Um, Pairing solar with storage is a great idea at some energetic cost, because now we have to build these batteries that, we, that weren't there before. But I still think trading carbon for energy is a great thing to do right now, just because society has plenty of excess energy. We're cruising along at like 18 right now. Um, the economists and the net energy analysis aren't really worried about economic damage until you get to about five or below that. That's when you start spending you know, 20% of your energy to get energy. Um, the absolute minimum you can get is two to one before shit falls apart because at that point, um, you're spending just as much energy as it takes to, to use that energy. So picture like you have a truck with a 20 gallon gas tank and you live, you live 20 gallons worth of gas away from the um, gas station. So you're like, get home, you're like, oh, I only have 20, 10 gallons of gas. That's how much I need to get to the gas station. I better drive to the gas station to fill up. You burn those 10 gallons, now you're at zero. Fill up your tank with 20 gallons, drive home, and now you're at 10 gallons again. So you spend all your time and energy getting energy. And so below two to one, it falls apart. But we're at 18 to one, so we should trade energy for carbon. So I think anything up here is a great idea. Um, storing energy from the power grid directly, I think is a terrible idea because you're just adding carbon and adding energy costs to the, to the power grid. Um, somebody asked, what does curtailment mean? That means um, <coughs> uh, in certain times of the day, uh, there, in particular with wind, there's too much wind available on the grid. There's more supply than there is demand. It happens especially in places like Texas where they have um, uh, loosely regulated power markets. And so anybody can be a power provider. You can build a wind turbine on your ranch and sell it. And so a lot of ranchers were doing that because it's a way to supplement their income. But it led to these, these times, particularly at night when everybody's asleep, there's too much wind on the grid. So you can 
curtail it. You can just turn the, um, the uh, you can rotate the wind turbine to be parallel with the wind so it no longer harvests wind. So that's, it's called feathering or curtailing. Uh, so I wrote a paper back in 2013 called to store or curtail a net energy analysis. And so I asked, is it better to just way overbuild wind turbines and use them when you want to, when you need them, or just build the perfect amount of wind turbines and energy storage so that you can satisfy energy demand over the course of a year, for example. And it turns out it costs way less energy to just build a bunch of wind turbines than to build wind and storage. It's cheaper to build a wind turbine energetically than it is to build a complex uh, electrochemical battery like a lithium ion battery. And it seems kind of obvious, right? You don't have to get cobalt and lithium from all over the globe and assemble it together into this complex device. Instead, you just build a wind turbine. Um, it was called a shill for the oil companies and hated by the storage community after that paper came out. Uh, but I really was just trying to do the right thing. Um, storage is great. Curtailing is great. I think uh, economically and energetically, it makes more sense just to overbuild. But uh, it's hard to find investors that want to do that because they want to maximize the return for their investment. They're like, I'm not going to build a bunch of wind turbines if I can't sell electricity 100% uh, of the time. But maybe we just need some like um, ecotopia government and then that would work out. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. Okay. The problems with net energy analysis. You guys hit on these already. Measuring total energy inputs is totally is really difficult. Uh, requires knowledge of many processes, embodied energy. It requires both a technical understanding of society and an economic understanding. It's usually uh, not too many people have that sort of thing. Uh, system boundaries. Uh, um, are usually different from different from study to study. So it's hard to compare different studies. Metrics are poorly defined, defined total inputs. One of the biggest problems is energy comes in all these different flavors. We learned about that like in lecture seven, right? Uh, not all jewels are created equal. A joule of electricity is much more valuable than a joule of waste heat and a cup of coffee. And so you can't just measure things on a joule by joule basis. And so people are doing all sorts of things like trying to convert everything to to electricity to put it on an equal playing field. So if you have 100 joules of coal, that only really equals 33 joules of electricity because two thirds of it goes up the smokestack. So we're just working it all out right now. Uh, another problem with it is results can really be overemphasized. Um, Charlie Hall, bless his heart, he he started this field, but he's a doomer. Um, I find a lot of these like aging baby boomers to be like, kind of like projecting their own mortality on the world or something. And they're just saying like, oh, we're running out of energy. We're all gonna be eating each other next year. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, probably won't happen. And um, using, using um, yeah, net energy analysis or EOI to, to prognosticate end times, I think uh, makes us look like quacks and we should just focus on, um, you know, helping, not, not going down that doom route. Um, yeah, so if you start Googling that energy analysis or ERI, you'll find a bunch of doomy, doomy stuff. Carol, there some boomers get it. That's definitely true. All right. Um, yeah, don't overemphasize or overgeneralize generations as well. Uh, that's it. Any questions? Okay, so there is class Monday. We'll talk about wind and solar. No class Wednesday. And then guest lecture next Friday, the 13th. Um, and yeah, email me if you're having trouble with podcast groups and I'll probably just put you into a low, low number of, of a group with a low number of people. All right. Happy Friday. Have a good one. What's the efficacy of using right, question? What did the terms mean when we were talking about the equations? E sub D E. Okay. Yeah. So Here's EROI for that coal power plant. EG means uh, the energy for generation. C means construction. OP means operation or OPEX. D means decommissioning. I'll show you that more clearly right here. I also have a question, but it's about like the future tech. All right. 
other questions, thoughts, concerns? What is the efficacy of using curtailed wind or solar to store to store to the grid? Um, uh, it's mainly the idea is using um, geologic spacing of renewable resources like wind or solar. Uh, the ultimate idea is to have like interconnected solar panels and wind turbines across the globe. And that way there's always sun or wind somewhere to satisfy demand. So half of it would be popping off in terms of solar and half of it would be in dark and, but you'd always have enough. And so if you overbuilt these systems, then, uh, then you could always have some renewable resource somewhere to, to allow for society to be powered and you just squander the rest. Um, I've written different like grant proposals where you could take the excess wind and even decarbonize natural gas streams, right? So you could just uh, pyrolytically shock natural gas, drop the carbon out, this carbon black that you could then sell to like either battery manufacturers or printer ink companies. And then you'd just be left with hydrogen and you can enrich natural gas streams by about 10% in hydrogen and not have any ill effects to power plants or home, home use whatsoever. And so that's one idea. Um, you could use, you could just take this excess energy and use it for something that's needed otherwise. A desalination of water is another interesting idea. Um, another question, would solid state batteries change the build to many turbines idea? Um, I don't know, good question. Uh, <clears throat> right now, solid state batteries, if I'm not mistaken, are pretty much um, primary batteries, you can only discharge them. You can't recharge them over and over and over again because you don't have like a migration of ions, but maybe I'm stupid. Um, there's these ideas of like sulfur air, lithium air batteries where the uh, anode is the atmosphere itself. And people are building these clever different shapes like, you know, these, 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 um, crystals that allow the expansion and then, then to allow a big ion uh, with an electron cloud and then they can shrink back down. But I don't know, it's, it's beyond me. Um, but look at like air batteries and that, that would be revolutionary. But so far we're only getting like a few charge recharges out of it, like 20. And if, yeah, you could only charge your laptop 20 times, you'd be pretty pissed off. Thank you. A good question. All right, I'm out of here. Goodbye, everyone. How do I quit Zoom? Stop, share, leave, and end meeting for all. <laughs>